Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is container life cycle management. Gnosis Freight Streamlines International Logistics with my friend Jake Hoffman. Jake is the Chief Technical Officer at Gnosis Freight. By the way, Gnosis is spelled G-N-O-S-I-S. Gnosis Freight pioneered the world's first container life cycle management platform, which is a supply chain platform focused on the full life cycle of your shipping containers and everything inside your shipping containers. International shipping is very difficult. It's complicated. It's complex. Lots of issues like detention, demurrage, and delays, and so many more. And there are not very many solutions out there that give you the data insights and the visibility and the technology to solve those problems. Unless, of course, you're working with my friends at Gnosis Freight. To learn more about how Gnosis Freight streamlines international logistics, please take a listen to my conversation with Jay Kaufman. How's it going, Jake? Joe, it's going great, man. Long time listener. I'm very glad to be here. I'm excited to talk to you about this topic. We've been talking for 45 minutes. We realized we're going to have to run out of time if we don't hit record. So it's it's always great to talk to you, Jake. Please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. So I'm Jake Hoffman, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Gnosis Freight, calling today from Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, Our entire company is based here in Charleston. We're 35 to probably over 40 people now, all based here in the, in the office in Charleston. Gnosis Freight, we specialize in container lifecycle management. We're a logistics technology company, software for international freight. And it's been we've been focused on the ocean container forever. And uh, we've gotten into air freight and then we track rail. We do some over-the-road domestic. And so anything for our large shipper customers and truckers and everybody else in the freight world. Very nice. Very nice. So I know the name is Gnosis Freight, and we were talking before when we were prepping, and I kept saying Gnosis, and you're like, hey, there's a lot of companies named Gnosis, so make sure you say Gnosis Freight, otherwise they're going to, and by the way, I was, this morning before we got on the line, I did just type in Gnosis, I was like, okay, that's not getting me there, and I was like, and then I typed in Gnosis Logistics, then finally found it, Gnosis Freight. Um, it, you're on page one, but Gnosis is, first off, tell us what Gnosis means. And that is Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. You don't see a lot of words in English that start with G-N. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the G-N is, we have customers that we've had for five years now that still call us Genosis or any and all, all of the above. But so Gnosis is a Greek word. Our CEO, Austin McCombs, when he, he started the company in 2017, and he Grew up, he had a best friend that was Greek, and he had a lot of interactions. He went to Greece with his friend, and he was uh, big into the Greek culture and learned about this word that was gnosis. The meaning of it is to learn through experience. And he felt that kind of hit home with how he wanted to build a software company was instead of going the route of, hey, we're going to raise a bunch of money and have this cool platform and it's going to solve problems. It was a really slow, iterative process of we're going to get deep in the weeds with our customers and pain points and learn through experience because we often literally worked as an operator at a freight forwarder. And so to learn through experience of what are the problems that, that our customers are going to be facing and then use that to develop our software. Very nice. Now, who does Gnosis Freight serve? So our primary customer forever has been the BCO, the beneficial cargo owner, the shipper, right? BCO, just the the term that we are so used to using in international freight for the person that's actually receiving the freight at the end of the day, receiving that container. So we focused on shippers since the beginning. In coming to serve the shippers, we started developing our own container tracking data, our own models, our own predictive analytics, and, and our platform. And realize that in order to serve the shippers, sometimes it's necessary to work with uh, a freight forwarder, an ocean carrier, a customs broker, a drayage carrier, drayage, the truck that's picking a container up at an ocean terminal or a rail terminal. And so that's when we got the data working so well that the other parties in the supply chain were saying, hey, we would, how can we use this? And so we branched off and now we, we work with pretty much everybody. And it's nice to have the customers in all the different segments of international for one from a 
a business perspective for diversification and those kind of things. But two is because when we have great partners and, and all the different places, it allows us to be able to put things together better than you would otherwise. Because if we have one a trucker that's our customer that we work with and we're super close with and ingrained with, then it's a better connection for us to work with the shipper that they serve. So there's a lot of synergies there. Yes. And we'll get into this more in a minute, but the nature of international logistics, when I'm shipping a container from Asia or Europe to the US, there's a lot more complexities, more, a lot more complexities, a lot more problems associated with that kind of freight. We were talking, we were prepping. If you look at an over the road shipment here, not easy, <laughs> but it's usually a shipper, maybe a broker, a trucking company and a receiver. It's not, and we all speak the same language. We might be one time zone away. That's easier, much easier than what you're talking about with international logistics, where it's somebody who's on the other side of the world in a different time zone, different culture, different everything. A lot more hands have to touch it. There's international law. There's so much more that can go wrong, which we learned during COVID. So this is the Rubik's Cube <laughs> to solve. It's a huge problem. It's difficult. And I'm not here to tell you that we have totally solved it and there's nothing else to figure out. It's a battle every day. But it's, it's exciting from that standpoint to be working at a place like Gnosis where the problem in front of you is so large. There, It is so difficult. And, and I, I alluded to it when we were prepping where it's, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And we know that. And it's interacting with the parties that are on a totally different time zone. I don't wake up any day and I don't have emails from people around the world at 2 and 3 a.m. my time talking about something with data or with the platform, whatever it is. And so it's a fun problem fun is a, is a funny word to put there but it's a fun problem because it's so large yeah jake tell us a little bit about you where'd you grow up where'd you go to school some career highlights before you joined gnosis freight so appreciate it joe i grew up in birmingham alabama i i grew up in alabama and went to auburn university was where I, I wanted to go to school i grew up going to football games cam newton and the national championship nice. in 2010 was right before i got to auburn so it was a great time then Life's been tough recently because Alabama and Georgia are my two biggest rivals and, and have been forever. So that's a little bit tough there. But I went to Auburn. I studied chemical engineering. I think I thought I wanted to be a doctor at one point. I studied chemical engineering because people told me it was the hardest major. And that was the one that makes the most money out of school. And all right, perfect. I'm going to do the hardest one there. And I went, I lived in Houston for a couple of years doing some different things, but I kept in touch with my friend, Austin McCombs, that I was, became friends with at Auburn and he was studying supply chain and data science. And I was keeping in touch with him and he was doing some cool stuff with computers and he was writing Python and he was working on some stuff and I kept in touch with him and he actually helped influence me to make a career change. And that's why I decided to go to Georgia Tech. And I wanted to get my master's at Georgia Tech. I went to study quantitative and computational finance was the, the name of the program where I was going to get my master's. And I was doing that because I wanted to be a quant trader. I wanted to go live in Chicago and trade options and do the, the cool high tech. You got eight computer screens at your desk and you're trying to look at what's happening in the market and make decisions really quickly. And I actually got to school and started studying that and interviewed and, and accepted a job offer to move to Chicago. But all the while, Austin had been plugging here and there. Hey, you should come to Charleston and check out what I'm working on. And so I actually did an internship. I say internship, quote unquote, internship where it was just Austin and myself in Charleston. And I walked in, I've told this story a bunch recently where Austin just had a, a giant, it was basically a garage and he had sticky notes all over the wall. And it was person, container gets loaded here, it gets on a boat, it goes here, it's got a clear customs. And there was hundreds of these sticky notes. And that was in 2018 at the time when he was just putting together the thesis of the business and everything we were working on. And then I joined right after that. I worked while I was still at Georgia Tech moved to Charleston. I got married, convinced my wife to move to Charleston. My wife, Aubrey, God bless her for following me to Charleston when I was just sticking notes on a wall and believing in us and what we were doing. But the rest is history. And we've convinced people to come to Charleston and work with us and just tackle these huge problems that, that exist in international freight. I love it. And I think it says a lot about you, Jake, that you were Oh, what's the most challenging undergrad? Chemical engineering? Oh, I'll do that. And then decide I want to be a quant. 
like these are these most college kids are like hey i want to i want to get into whatever school i can get into the best one i can and then i want to go to parties and chase girls or chase boys and that might be the case <laughs> i did a little bit of that at auburn and that's how i was lucky to meet my wife aubrey at auburn because i was a little bit social there i think i probably got serious after school we'll say, we'll say it we'll leave it at that <laughs> yeah there's a wonderful culture and you mentioned going to auburn we were talking last week about it maybe two weeks ago and you said it's hard to be an Auburn guy because of Georgia and Alabama being so good at football. And I will say I'm a Michigan guy and having Ohio State as your rival and not just them, but also have there's lots of good schools like Notre Dame that we play on a regular basis. And I used to say we lost to Buckeyes many years in a row. And it was like people go, oh, you got to do something different. I was like, we're losing one game a year to the, a top three team. It's horrible, but it ha you have to swallow it because it's not. Yeah, Auburn's a fine program, fine schools. And it's funny how we just define everything by our football program. <laughs> Imagine the yeah. president of Auburn, if he was to hear, he goes, is that all you see us for, Jake? <laughs> no, it's not. I, the engineering program at Auburn was incredible. The culture there, the campus is beautiful. And, and I've since then gone to many different college campuses for recruiting or for trips or conferences or whatever it is. And I'm I will always appreciate Auburn for what it is and and being such a, I don't know, homely, comfortable, everybody's nice. It's Yeah, so I appreciate Auburn a ton for what it is. And I bring up the things about football just because it's funny. And we have Georgia and Alabama grads that work at Gnosis, and I have to deal with that year long. <laughs> but it's great. And I yeah, my Auburn experience, I wouldn't trade it for the world. And Georgia Tech, it was a totally different experience being at Georgia Tech and being in Atlanta and the the companies that came to the the career fair that I went to at Georgia Tech, it was crazy. It was you walk in and it was a who's who of the top tech companies in the world that are recruiting there. And I was not used to that because I was in chemical engineering, something totally different. But it was cool to walk in and see the PayPal and Facebook, Meta and those kind of companies recruiting. There's good reason they're there. Exactly. Yeah. Great school. I just told you before we hit record that my nephew just visited Georgia Tech. He wants to be an engineer. And college. And he chose Michigan, which is close to home. Great school too. But Georgia Tech, these are all great schools. I, I, I always say we've estimated the value of these brands, but they're still great schools. They are. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, let's switch gears. So back to the topic, which is container lifecycle management. Gnosis streamlines, inter Gnosis Freight streamlines international logistics. And I want to talk about ocean freight ocean freight first we can talk about i know that's not the sole thing you guys do but we talked a little bit about how ocean freight works could you walk us through where it be how it goes and because not everybody who listens is necessarily an ocean freight guy talk about that container coming let's just say from somewhere in asia and coming somewhere to the middle of the united states please explain that process the, pr the prime example that i always give people that that is also does a good job of painting the picture of the data of, of how everything moves is we'll do the, something comes from Shanghai to Los Angeles. And then there's also a rail move where it goes to Chicago. And so what'll happen is the customer who's in the end going to receive it at a distribution center in Chicago will make a booking either with a freight forwarder or an ocean carrier. And they're saying, Hey, I have this, my vendor, my, the factory I'm buying from is outside of Shanghai. And I want to pay for a container, a 40 foot container from Shanghai to Chicago. And the ocean carrier will have all these different sailings as they have a schedule where the vessels go in a circle from Shanghai to LA. Maybe it also stops in Oakland or Vancouver or Seattle or somewhere. And then maybe in China, it's also stopping in Yantian. Some of them stop in Malaysia. There's that whole Trans-Pacific trade that happens. But the say it's furniture. It's it, There's a, a furniture manufacturer in Shanghai. They will get a container, a truck will pick up a, an empty container at an ocean terminal, at a giant ocean terminal in Shanghai and bring it to the factory. They'll load it full in boxes, cardboard boxes, or sometimes it's in pallets, just depends on how everything gets loaded there. Loaded at the factory, truck takes it back to the ocean terminal in Shanghai. It gets loaded on a, a big vessel. The vessel takes two weeks to, to 14 to 17 days, depending on the service for it to get to Los Angeles. The giant vessel pulls up at the ocean terminal, gets unloaded. From there, it gets on a, a truck that goes and puts it on a rail yard. At the rail yard, it gets put on a rail carrier. So the large class one rail carriers in the U.S., for the example I'm using, and the rail carrier trans 
transports that container from Los Angeles to Chicago. And so all in those different processes. And then once it gets to Chicago, there's another process where it gets unloaded and then a truck comes to pick it up and delivers it to a distribution center. And so I go through each of those individual pieces because what you and I talked about earlier, Joe, is there's so many different companies and different hands that touch that container along the way. You think there's a trucking company in China that picks up the container and takes it to a factory. The factory itself is opens the doors and puts stuff in the container and boxes and everything. Then they close it. And sometimes the same trucking company will pick it up again. Sometimes it's a different one to deliver to the terminal. The terminal is its own entity. They're responsible for picking up with a crane that container and putting it on the vessel and making sure it's the right one. Someone might own the vessel. And so there's all these different people all the way through to uh, a truck picking it up in Chicago and taking it to the distribution center that physically interact with the container and are picking it up and doing things with it, but then also digitally have to interact with the data around that to make sure that all the documentation's there, a proof of delivery at the the final distribution center it's going to. And so there's all these interactions that happen physically, but there also has to be a digital trail for all these things to happen in the, in the right format in the right way. Yep. There's so many handoffs. And I always say any process, I worked in automotive engineering for many years. And we used to always say the handoffs are critically important. Because if I say I'm going to give you something, Jake, on Friday, May 18th, Saturday, May 18th, <laughs> if I say I'm going to give that to you, and it's supposed to be a completed model, or it's supposed to be a package already wrapped, and I give it to you, but you don't check it because you don't have time, the quality of that handoff might be compromised. So I give it to you, but you might have to give it back. Or I didn't dot the I's and cross the T's, and now the process goes and it's already compromised. And that can happen in any process. The handoffs, well, we talked about football in the beginning. Handoffs can be the difference between winning and losing in a football game. A poor handoff leads to a fumble. Same thing in any business. Yeah. And I'll say the last thing, thing I'll say on that is that's why, and people always talk about how easy it is to track your Amazon shipment and why can't we do that in the ocean freight world? And that's the goal of that United States Postal Service or UPS, right? You can check your phone. Hey, it's going to be delivered today at 3 p.m. The reason they can do that is because they can do that all themselves. They own all the infrastructure and the trucks and everything to be able to tell you, hey, it's on our truck and it's going to be delivered here. Yes, does. But in international freight, when it's all these handoffs, in order for that to be the case for international freight, you'd have to get data from all those different parties on a normal cadence and be able to, to put it all together and give that to the customer. Yep. I love it. I love it. So the container itself, that's usually owned by the shipping company, correct? Actually, so sometimes it is. So sometimes it'll be owned by the ocean carrier. And then sometimes there's an actual owner of the container that leases it out. And there's some really large companies that do that. And you can tell who it is sometimes. And you'll see it like there's like Triton is one of them. And there's these different container companies that own the actual steel 40 foot container. And then they lease it out to the ocean carries the world, the MERSC and CMA and MSC and, and, and on down the line. Yep. So what are some of the challenges in that process that you just described? The challenges, and I, and I'll, I always start at the data, and I know we, we talk about data and visibility and everybody in the world wants to talk about those things. But for us, that's where we start just to set the table. Of, it's important to do this first so that you can do all these other things. The real problems are I want to make sure I'm not costing my company too much money. I want to make sure that I plan to have enough people at the warehouse to unload a container. I want to know when something's going to get to the final destination so I can tell my customer. So the problems are all in the actual execution piece of I want to make sure my supply chain works well. But in order for all those things to happen, you got to have the data right first. And that was where getting the data. And I, I tell the story sometimes of it was a constant imposter syndrome where Gnosis just started out wanting to build the software. We wanted to take the data that existed, connect it to our customers and tell them, hey, this shipment's going to be late. And we just wanted, we were like, surely, I say the imposter syndrome, surely there's someone out there that's already done this and we can piggyback on the data piece. <laughs> and you find out it it doesn't exist in a perfect way. And so we went out and got data from the ocean carriers, the terminals, the rail carriers, the satellite, putting all those pieces of data together so that you can do the, the stuff and solve the actual problems of what there is. Right. You told me before we hit record, you said that getting 
high quality data wasn't easy, but also getting high quality data at scale wasn't easy. And how I'm thinking of it, I'm, I'm, I'm sure this is the way you guys thought of it, is I want all of this now I want this data so I can do some analysis. It's not for the data sake. It's for the sake of figuring out what's going, what's going wrong, having some new insights so I can take action. And I always say data and KPIs and all that isn't for the sake of data or KPIs. It's for the sake of a good conversation with some insights that allow me to take action. Please elaborate. <laughs> To, and our, our CRO, Michael, does a great job of talking about this when he uh, is talking to potential customers and we use it when we're talking to current customers is if you're just sitting there looking at data, something's wrong. It's like the, the data is there for you to go dive into to see why something had happened. But if you're spending all your time trying to identify the exceptions in the supply chain, that's not a good use of your time. The good use of your time is handling the exceptions. If there's a shipment that that uh, gets stuck at the port for some reason and you start incurring demurrage, Gnosis' job is to tell you that is happening and to tell you, hey, this is the container that's going to cost you the most money if you don't go pick it up by tomorrow, right? And so if someone had just a giant spreadsheet of all the containers they were moving and then their job was to take that and filter through it and sort by some dollar value of what's expensive, that's when you're looking at data and we would rather, we as a Gnosis would rather our customers action on that. We surface all the things that are important and identify the exceptions. And then we, the humans, the people that are in the supply chain are the people that act on top of that. Yep. So what are some of the problems that you, so are you creating, are you improving the data, filtering the data, improving it in any way? A lot of it is taking data and normalizing it from all the different data sources. So we have our opinionated language on what a container data model should look like. I mentioned that we talked through a container gets on a vessel in Shanghai and then it goes to LA and so on. We've taken and what our opinion on what it should look like and based on our customer's feedback that continues to iterate over and over, i like, this is the journey of a container. And then we take data from the ocean carrier themselves, from the satellite for the ships, from the rail carriers themselves that transport a container, from the individual terminals that tell you if a container is available or not. And we put, we take all those different data sources and pump it in. And then we have one single container tracking engine that normalizes it, standardizes it. It translates what the individual milestones mean from each party, standardizes it. And then on top of that, you can make some good predictions. What do you mean by normalized data? So let's just say I get data from a port and it says, hey, we received it on this day. What do you, What are you doing to normalize that? So it may be in a, a dumb example is if they say it was norm, it, we got it at this time. What we have to understand was that at 7 a.m. Pacific time or was that at, so you have to get the data. Oh, so the, the time zones in international freight. I'm sure anybody would that works in international freight would appreciate think it. Of that right away. But it's true because if you say, yeah. I'll get it there by 7 a.m. And then later on, Jake calls and says, hey, it's supposed to be there by 7 a.m. No, 7 a.m. my time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And they, and it's crazy how important that can be. We've seen maybe people's uh, payment terms. You're supposed to pay your suppliers net 30, so 30 days from the time a vessel departs. If a vessel departs on Friday at 7 p.m., their local time, but then the time zone on the data is wrong and it actually says it was at Saturday at 8 a.m., maybe it's 30. Days. There's those things that add up quickly if the data is not super granular, time zone, all those kind of things. So time zones one. Another is just simply the date that a container was loaded on a vessel. Everybody has a different meaning for that. They'll say loaded, dispatched, put on it. They might also use like here in the U.S. We'll use like today's date is May 17th. So we would say 5 slash 17 2024. The rest of the world probably does it the right way, which is 2024 may 7th exactly so the year the month the date we do it just inside out <laughs> and that's what on the in on the input that matters and what people are telling us but it also matters on the output because we have customers that are around the world and if we just give everybody the month day year they look at us crazy yeah <laughs> it's a little thing that matters <laughs> right yeah so where do you get all the data how do you get access to all the data from all around all these different parties around the world ports etc in a perfect world, everybody would have an API that I can just click and get access to and type in my credentials. That's definitely not the case. It's <clears throat> APIs, it's EDI, it's email, Excel sheets. 
it's SFTP with a CSV file. The long journey of getting the data from all these different places, we talk, we always, we focus on the data in order to empower the rest of our system. And when we talk to people about the data, you know, why, why can't other people just do this? Other people do it. There's other companies that are in the space aggregating container tracking data and things. It's not a moat, like it's not impossible. We don't have some special IP from the government that says we can get this data and nobody else can. Austin, our CEO always says it's, it's not a moat, it's a desert. And just to be able to trudge through the desert of integrating with all these different people and no whatever format they can send it to you. We have the like a API, EDI, SFTP of a CSV file, email at Excel reports, all these different things. We have to understand, write the code, standardize and do all the stuff I'm talking about for the hundreds of different places we've integrated to. Yeah, you guys have taken on what I'll call just the massive challenge of transitioning a small part of the world, which is international logistics, supply chains, from the old world, which was, I have all sorts of data. It's literally in folders, in file cabinets, which we've all still see. We still see paperwork on everyone's desk and getting it all available because everybody needs that data, yet it's all siloed. And when we say siloed, it's some of it's siloed online, which is one step closer and you guys can work with us on that, but still we still have stuff that's paper or emails, which we love emails, but the challenge with emails is it's unstructured. A supply chain VP said to me, if probably just before COVID, he said, Joe, how much longer are we going to tolerate emails in our process? And what he was getting at is I want everything in our systems and email's great. But if I say, Jake, I'm, I'm charging you 12, hundred dollars for that shipment. And then later on, I sent a note and said, Hey, Jake, it's actually 1250. That's an, and you wrote back. Sure, Joe, I understand. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's outside my system. So the ch big challenge you guys are taking on is bringing everything first online and then taking all of this information from all these different silos, normalizing it. So we can actually have those data insights that you talked about earlier. That's right. And it's one of those things where I, I think a common complaint in Ocean Freight Forever has been the standardization of data. And so there are parties like the, the DCSA, the Digital Container Shipping Association, is doing a fantastic job. They have a standard data model. They work with the ocean carriers and the terminals and people to get that model working. And that's great for us, for people like us that are instead of having to fit and translate, we can plug and play with the people that are on board and doing those kind of things. But then uh, a couple of things. One is there's a lot of parties that aren't doing that yet, that don't have the technical capability of an API that fits the standard and does those things. And so in, we're not going to wait where we can't just sit there and tell everybody, hey, you got to send us data in this API and it's got to do this thing because people in the logistics industry are out there moving stuff around the world and making the world run, right? And, and sometimes they don't have the capacity or the, maybe they don't want to get this data in the perfect little format that everybody says. And so we take that on that responsibility ourselves to go and do that and build this model that you can then take action on. And I, it's, I, we, we were talking about the data and I'm glad we're getting into the details of it and, and how it works and why it's important to have it standardized and everything else. But to your point that uh, you, you mentioned a little bit ago, the important thing is what do you do with that? You know, we can get this data standard, but then we've worked super closely with our customers on then what? We get this data good, and then what are you doing? It's identifying demerit and attention. It's auditing ocean freight invoices or drage invoices or those things or planning labor. There's all those things that you can do once that data is standardized and online, like you've said. Right. But the challenge is we will talk demurrage, detention, invoice auditing, delays, all those problems. One way to get out of those problems is have really good data and say, okay, yeah, we have great information. Right now, what we're doing is making a lot of decisions. This is my hunch. This is my gut tells me, hey, usually these guys get it here by Friday, right? It's, it's, I'll call it tribal knowledge, but it's not making decisions based on data. And when we're talking about billions and billions of dollars spent on international logistics, it would be nice if we didn't make big decisions based on a hunch. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And that's, we find new use cases for all the data every day. Analyzing transit times is something that, that people use our data for 
very frequently and it's not it can be just to forecast when stuff's going to get there and we give our predictive eta according to all the containers we're tracking about when you can expect something at your warehouse but then you also can take the past six months and when you go into a negotiation with a freight forward or an ocean carrier or somebody you say hey you told me it was going to take 30 days well 90 percent of the time it took 35 and so that that knowledge is, is super important for planning and doing other things that's all possible through just analyzing the data that, that we give them yep so the problems be once you have the data you can start to do some analysis and see where we're spending too much money or where we're having delays and so I mentioned demurrage and detention please explain what those are and the differences between them so demurrage is the time when the bco the, the shipper becomes responsible for a container either at an ocean terminal or at a rail terminal. So I mentioned that rail piece, if the ocean carrier can bring it to Chicago for you and then it gets unloaded and then you're responsible for going to pick it up. Everybody that moves an ocean container has free time at that the place of pickup. And so at a rail terminal, sometimes it's 24 hours, sometimes it's 48 hours from the time that a, a container gets available for pickup at a rail terminal. And then at an ocean terminal, so if someone's going to pick it up at Los Angeles, Long Beach, Charleston, any of those places, It'll be four working days or four calendar days or a week or whatever it is. It's a little bit longer, but still not that long. And every second that you leave it there, that's real estate that the terminal or the rail terminal is using and operating on. So they start charging you. You can't just leave it there as just real estate for you to just use it as warehouse space. So you, you're responsible for going to pick it up. So they start charging you whenever it sits there for too long. And so that's demurrage on the front end. Then on the back end is the actual equipment. So you take that ocean container and you bring it to your warehouse. And instead of unloading it, you put it in the yard and you leave it there for two weeks or so. The ocean carrier wants that container back because they're not making any money on right. They charge you for getting it from point A to point B, but they want to charge somebody else to get it from point B to point C. And if you keep it at your yard, they can't do that. So then there's the detention or detention is another term for per diem. Per diem is what a lot of people call it for bringing that container back so that they can get reused. Yep. And during COVID, we had a real problem with detention and demurrage. And companies are being charged, I think, for demurrage saying, hey, you're responsible for this. You have to come pick it up. Yet they couldn't pick it up at the port. So companies got charged quite a bit of money. So we had some laws that changed after COVID in reaction to some of what was considered. And I don't think everyone was getting abuse, but there was some abuses. And I think some of it was somebody taking advantage. I think others was just a crazy moment in time where, where no, no one knew what to do. <laughs> so what was those law changes? Yeah, so that you're referring to the FMC, the Federal Maritime Commission, helped push through OSRA 22, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. And that's where for any time, one, they tried to prevent those abuses that you're talking about. And so whenever a container was in a part of the terminal where it just couldn't be picked up, there was no appointments to go pick it up, and it was under a stack or something, that it couldn't charge demurrage for that. It's, hey, we're not going to let you pick it up, and we're also going to charge you money. So that obviously doesn't make sense, and the, the, the law was put in place to try to refute those and not let stuff like that happen. And it also uh, added in some invoicing requirements where anytime you're going to send a demurrage invoice to a shipper or to somebody, you have to include all the data elements that prove that it is a legitimate demerge charge. It's the standard things, the container number, the vessel it came on, the port, the terminal that it's at, and then the date that it did become available. So, hey, we actually put it in the terminal where you could have come and pick it up on May 5th, and now it's May 11th, which is why I'm charging you money. So there's some invoicing requirements there. And there's been some further action on these things that recently where for per diem on the back end where it'll... Now, the responsibility of paying per diem for a while, the drayage carriers could pay it and audit those charges and things, and then they would bill the shipper. Now, what's going to happen is the shipper is going to be solely responsible for that, which is going to introduce some funny things on whose fault is it and who it is, but it'll be the, the actual shipper who's responsible for paying that on the back end. Yep. Let's switch gears. So if you are looking for a TMS, please consider my friends at Revanova. Revanova is a cloud-based transportation management system built on the Salesforce platform, which means it has a built-in CRM and a higher level of security, reliability, and performance. Revanova is used by many of the top 3PLs, brokers, carriers, and shippers because it has all the features. It's multimodal. 
and it comes with lots of premium features like predictive pricing. If you want to learn more, please visit Revenova.com. That's R-E-V-E-N-O-V-A.com. Or check the show notes for a link to my interview with Mike Horbath, one of the founders of Revenova. And just FYI, anyone's listening. So we have the Department of Transportation, which is responsible for over-the-road trucking. And then we have the Federal Maritime Commission, which is responsible for the port activity and the ocean for sh- o- ocean shipping, international shipping in general. But they overlap, I'm assuming, some places near the port. But anyway, so we're talking about container lifecycle management. And it, again, it's not necessarily just the container. It's what's in the container. But also, I want to make sure if I'm the owner of those containers, that they're moving efficiently. I don't want my container sitting around if I'm not getting paid for it. It's like having a a truck trailer. I want it to move, right? I don't, it's of no value to me if it's sitting around. So how does Gnosis Freight help me with streamlining the international logistics? And so what is the reason people are coming to you? They finally call back and go, okay, Jake, Let's talk. (laughs) You guys have been bugging me since we met. (laughs) Let's talk. Why are they coming to you? What's the problem they want solved usually? So it's, you know, once you have the the data and you're doing those things, you can make decisions based on it about prioritization. So you said you care about what is inside the container. And so something that we do for our shipper customers that's important and, and differentiating for us is we tell them through an integration with an ERP system or through getting information off the commercial invoice and packing list and stuff that comes from the supplier, we identify what's actually inside of it to tell our customer, hey, that's this container is full of tires that need to go to a Tesla plant or something. And so when you have that information about the actual inventory that's in a container, it allows you to make decisions about that container, not just based on that we talked about the local max and the local men versus the overall. Yeah, that's the local optimum. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so that's instead of just making a decision in simplest terms, you can like, hey, this container is the first one that got to the port that hasn't been picked up yet. So first in, first out, you can say, hey, this container that's about to get unloaded is super hot and has to get to this automotive facility by tomorrow. And so if you can make decisions based on those elements, that that introduces a whole new level of supply chain optimization and flow of the goods that, that we help our customers do. And so that that's one of the things, minimizing costs on the demerge, detention, and those kind of things, and really just being armed with information about everything. We had a, one customer a week or two ago that asked us, hey, why, are, why did this get so delayed? And because it was stuff that they cared about and it was containers that got super delayed. And we looked and it was because they had discharged in Panama and they were doing like something instead of going through the Panama Canal, they were going to get on a truck and go from one side of Panama to the other. And they sat in Panama for 35 days or something crazy. And that was net that was never a part of the plan. And I, I we don't exactly know what happened. It was like they just forgot about it or whatever it is. But with all the data and the analysis and stuff we had, we didn't predict that it was going to be sitting there for 35 days, but we could tell them exactly the vessel it got off, the one it was supposed to be on originally, and kind of what happened. So they're armed with these things that they can inform their customer, go back to their vendor and talk to them about it. So there's a lot of stuff that we help them with just on straight visibility into their supply chain. So I, I always think that when you're coming new to a problem, you always want to have data around it. And so you can make better decisions. But I think what we're all trying to do is get out of a reaction mode and get into a proactive mode. So when you're being reactive, it's just, hey, where's my stuff? It was supposed to be here 35 days ago. When you're being proactive, you're saying, hey, we have a process and we have expectations. We know milestones on this stuff. And I think we're all trying to move into a proactive place. But if I don't have if I don't have the data and the technology that allows me to get from that old place to the new place, then I'm going to struggle to get, be that proactive shipper that I want to be. That's right. And that's the prime Gnosis customers, the people that have been with us. And we, we always start with the, the visibility data. And then we've talked about demerge, detention management, all that stuff comes out of the box. 
And then we go the route of the execution piece where we help them make sure that they're allocating their freight to ocean carriers or freight forwarders, whoever appropriately, and making sure they're within their contracts and those kind of things of how they want their supply chain to work. And then through the execution to making sure they have the right truckers picking it up at destination. And so you go a step further beyond just the straight visibility into, you know, I want these truckers to get 30 containers a week and this other one to get 50 a week and so on. And then you can go to the distribution center or the final destination level and help them plan. Hey, we got a plan for 50 containers to get here next week. So I'm going to hire labor or make sure that I have the correct staff to, to see what's coming my way. And then people with Gnosis can you, you take it a step further where you start auditing all the invoices of, of these different parties. So you have the contracts in place for an ocean carrier or freight forwarder for the ocean move. And then so we have that contract and we have that data and then we can audit it appropriately. And then and same for the Dre Edge piece, same for demerge and attention and auditing those things. And so it's the life cycle, container life cycle management, but the cycle, the life cycle of a Gnosis customer is they start with just the visibility. We eliminate the excessive fees and things and they take control of it. And then there's so many other things that that companies continue to do with us and get more and more ingrained into the Gnosis ecosystem. Yep. So how does this interact? Is let's just say somebody says we are and we're large BCO. We have an ERP. They might have a warehouse management system. They might have a transportation management system. How do you work with that ecosystem of technologies that they're already using? And it's a lot of the time, the onboarding, the, the place that we start, people are super surprised when we say that we can start. We can get them live in two days. Whoa. <laughs> so we, we say that. And of course, that's it's there's always more to do. So it's not how you're done and I'm never talking to you again and you're using Gnosis in two days. But what we do is we try to show a quick win. We shot, We try to get the data flowing and get them using the system so they can see immediate value. And the way we do that is we have an engineer on every single account. So every single one of our customers has an engineer that is their account manager that is taking, if they get a report every day from their freight forwarder that says, hey, these are the shipments that you have that are coming. We put a, an email address that gets CC'd on those and using code and, and the software and the technology that, that our engineers have, have built can take the container numbers and the bill of ladings out of that and put it into Gnosis and everything starts tracking and they see it all. And then we just identify what the shipments are. And then we use all of our own data to track it. We don't rely on a EDI integration with anybody to get tracking data, right? It's all just done ourselves. And so that's where they immediately, like I said, within a day or two are seeing value. And here's what I should care about in my supply chain. Here's the actual ETAs. Here's, and all the data is updated on a really normal cadence with low latency and all those different things. Yeah, we love email because it is unstructured. I can send you a note today, Jake. I sent you a note yesterday about podcast equipment. It was easy. And I texted you, hey, check your email. That's easy. But the problem is if I'm trying to create some insights, I need to be able to connect all these emails somewhere and take the relevant points out and put it in a system. And so you've got some sort of bot that'll take that information out of these emails and put it in my system. So it's not just, I got a hundred emails from Jake about different things. Now it's, here's all that information in a system. Here's some KPIs. Here's some recommendations. That's right. And you mentioned, so we've talked about AI a little bit and some different things, and that's People talk about, oh, AI is going to predict ETAs better, or it's going to do supply chain demand planning better. And there's all those really cool use cases for what it is. But the most immediate value that we've seen is taking that unstructured data that you're talking about and turning it into structured data so that you can you can derive insights and actions from it. And the perfect example is a freight forwarder, somebody says, hey, just booked, here's the booking number on these containers. And it's an unstructured text, or maybe there's a PDF attached or whatever it is. That's an easy thing for us to recognize that this is a booking, take the container numbers or whatever out of it and start tracking it in Gnosis. And so that's, that's a great application for AI to go from unstructured to structured. And then you get all the value of Gnosis after that, because the structure is done up front. And I sometimes call that is if I got a PDF attached to an email, which there's a lot of that going on, <laughs> that is uh, static information. It, can't, it doesn't do anything. It's just stuck to that email. As soon as you guys take that from 
PDF format, put it into a field and with, and then combine it with other, other transactions. All of a sudden I've got dynamic information. I have something that can actually inform decision-making those PDFs, those word documents that are all attached. Those are good for that shipment. Maybe there's a pain in the ass, but they're, they're involved. They've been part and parcel of this business for a long time. That's right. Yep. So the static to dynamic, I might steal that from you, Joe. I like that a lot. That's good. <laughs> uh, Jake, all I do is repeat other things people said on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So getting back to it, there's a TMS that I'm using. Do you guys integrate with that? Or is it a, you guys have a separate platform I'm going to look at every morning or how does this work? It's, it can be both. We have some customers that only use our data. So like we track containers and we give them all the data around the vessel it's on and the ETAs and the last free day and availability and all those kind of things. And so that's an API and customers can access that at any time. If you are using our software, so if you're a shipper that's using the CLM platform, container lifecycle management platform, then you have access to the API and you can do the integration yourself and pull the data into your ERP system to update POs and dates to promise customers and all those kind of things. And that's all available there. It's both. We, we're we not a, a big fan of the, hey, here's our system and you got to jump into our box to to work with us. We do a whole lot to to meet people where they're at and whatever, however they're interacting with data, where some people use our data gets put into their existing TMS, or maybe they have their homegrown system that it gets put into, or there's all these different ways in which people interact with us. We tell people the best way that we found to interact with our data is in our system, is in CLM. But if they have another process and it's important that they do it and put it in their system, then no problem. We're super flexible in how we engage with everybody. I like that. I will say we're, we've evolved since we started using software. I've been around a lot longer than you have, Jake. And I always remember getting softwares and they say, you're going to start using this right away. This is your new world. And it was sometimes replacing a manual system, but sometimes it was awkward. Maybe the user interface wasn't right. And we were forced into it. And then it, when later on, when it was failed, those this is usually the people trained us and left. And then later on, you're like, why didn't this work out? I think the way we're looking at platforms and systems now is so much different and better because companies like yours now say, just what you said, I'll meet you where you're at. What If you have a process that, that our C- CLM can fit right into, perfect. If not, we'll figure out where we fit in. That's what we need. And so I was looking at your website this morning before we uh, hit record. You have some testimonials on there. And it was what companies are, are bent, the advantages they're seeing, the savings they're getting. So without mentioning the names, unless you want to, what are some of the advantages that they, your customers are seeing from using this container lifecycle management? Yeah. And, and- for a while, it was demerge and detention. And the, the cost of the stuff that we've talked about on eliminating those costs, when those were huge line items in the budget that weren't planned for, we had customers come to us that were paying $50 million a year in oh. crazy costs, which is, I know. And, and it's crazy to see that. And so that's where that was the highest value for them was for us to come in and help them. We had employees at these large companies where their entire job was to figure out what was costing them money. So to get data from their freight forwarders and put it, do a big V lookup and put it all in a spreadsheet and then sort by a date and say, Hey, this is what's costing us money. And well, a lot of that, it's the second you put data in an Excel sheet, it's static to your point. It goes from a dynamic data point somewhere to static where it's immediately stale and old. And then if you're doing all that, it's an employee spending a ton of time trying to understand what is costing money and where it is instead of taking action to prevent it from costing money. And so that's where the immediate value we saw for a while was with customers and just getting the data low latency up to speed, helping them understand what was costing them money, and then they could take action on top of it. So a lot of our testimonials are from the past few years on, a we were spending a million dollars a month and now we're spending nothing. And NOS has helped us go from a million dollars a month to zero. Now, in demerge and detention, it'll probably come back. It spikes and goes away with how, with congestion at the ports and capacity and warehouses and those kind of things. So it'll come back right now. It's not as much of an issue. And so we've really leaned into auditing. We have a, a lot of customers that use us for invoice auditing and we got into invoice auditing because we realized, hey, a lot of our 
data is being used by somebody to say, hey, if it's, I mentioned the thing about the time zones earlier, it sailed on this date, which means it should have been on this contract, which means we should have been charged $3,500 and we were charged 4,000. And so we have all that data in our system and on the back end. And so our engineers do a really good job of meeting our customer where they're at in their freight audit process to, their, I think some of the drayage auditing and for the, the truckers picking up the container. There's some analysis where we're like saving them 17 or $18 a container on average. And if you're moving 5,000 containers a month, which those customers are, then that adds up quick. And, and it also is not to mention paying their vendors on, on an average of eight days or something where previously it was 35. And so there's all these other side elements that you get when you can get all the data and the auditing and stuff going quickly that you convert things to cash a whole lot faster. It makes your vendors super happy when you can pay them in eight days instead of 35. I think also, and this is what's happening, we've all seen this already in our lives. As soon as you have somebody pulling together the data, the insights that are immediate, as you mentioned, we quickly, we already know demurrage, detention, we're catching those even without technologies, but you guys are catching them right away. Those are slam dunk, easy. The value you'll add a year from now is going to be much greater. And that's just the nature of what happens when you have systems and data. We just get better and better. And then as we start to apply AI, by the way, before we hit record, you and I were messing around. You were in chat GPT. I was using Google Gemini. We're trying to come up with a title. It's amazing how quickly we were coming up with titles for this. We had 30 titles that we had to go through. That's the, the challenge was the weakness was Jake and me having to look through them. Yeah, trying to figure it out. Yeah. And imagine in a year or two, AI will say, here is the optimum title for this podcast, Joe. <laughs> but getting back to it, the cool stuff that you're going to share a year from now is probably even higher value than the, what you're already doing. And I think important to note for us, and it's how, like I mentioned, the, the current life cycle of an ideal Gnosis customer is a start with the data, and then you get into the processes and you get into the optimization we have a ton of stuff that we're like working with customers. We're in beta. We always do everything. It's all customer driven, demand driven. We have customers moving 100,000 containers a year that are using us now for auditing. And then the next piece of that is they're like, hey, all this was really cool. But now we want to look at the domestic auditing piece or we want to look at carbon emissions. It's a huge thing that, that we've gotten deep in the weeds with. And so when you have all the data and you get better and better at doing that, there's all these elements of what we can do next. And that informs our product roadmap. But in our office, we have a list of five or six things that we continuously hear from our large customers that are, hey, this is what we're going to do in the next three months. And Q3, it'll be done. And then we've got some case studies already. And it's large customers that trust us that are working on us with. And so the way that our platform looks today is totally different than it'll look a year from now. Awesome. Awesome. So one other thing I want to ask you, we over the road, we use ELD data. You guys are you using ELD data for some of what you're doing? We do. And it's the ELD piece where we go is whenever one, whenever we work with a drainage carrier that uses us for the container data up until they pick it up. And then maybe they're using our system and they want to know like, all right, we picked it up and then we're, is the truck getting to the customer on time or something? And so that's where we tap into the ELD data to do that and then make that connection between the truck ID, the asset ID and the container they picked up. So we do it for them. And then also the reverse of that is whenever a shipper is working with a carrier and they want to get the full visibility of what Gnosis does, then we can tap into the ELD in that reverse way. And so it's doing that. It's another data source that plugs into our giant model of how we get that full end-to-end -end visibility on that journey is you have to take data from different places and stitch it all together. Yep. So I know you're using data from a whole bunch of different sources. So you're getting stuff from the ports. There's all sorts of milestones that we have. How much of the data right now is coming from the internet of things? So maybe a sensor that's on a container. It'll, I think, so that's probably the, the lowest place now and it's continuing to grow. And you and I talked briefly before we we uh, hit record and, and started talking that the ocean carriers have started equipping a lot of their containers with the IoT devices. Hapag Lloyd made a big announcement a couple of months ago, and so we're supporting that. And so our customers that, that work with Hapag Lloyd, we, can, we already have the API connection set up. It can work with them. There's the reefer containers. A lot of those have had the IoT devices for a while where you can actually tap into 
not only the location, but then sometimes the temperature and the humidity and things like that, that's important to the, the goods that are moving within a reefer container. It's all of those data sources are getting better and better. And it's exciting for us as a, an aggregator of this data to have a, yet another super granular piece of data to add to our system. It doesn't solve a, like the problem in totality. And so it's, if you know where the container is, that's great, but maybe is it at the bottom of a stack at the terminal? Is it cleared customs? Is it, so there, there's all the, these other places you still have to go, but it definitely makes it a lot easier and makes our customers experience better. There's more stuff you can do with it. We'll have the context going, it'll just get better. And it, it, as we go forward, we are really just in the infancy of all this. So one thing, and I know I didn't talk to you about this before, but one last question about this before we wrap it up. I've always worked in logistics and transportation. Before that, I worked in automotive. And we would always have reports and KPIs that we would develop. And a lot of times we were putting the information and it was somewhat subjective. I'd say, oh, yeah, I was supposed to get there by noon. I don't know what time it actually got there. I don't have the proof of delivery. I just say it got there by 11 a.m. And usually that's the lowest person in the organization. It's a clerk. But the clerk doesn't want to get in trouble by having late. So they say, oh, yeah, I got there at 11 o'clock. Until so somebody proves me wrong, I got there at 11 o'clock. <laughs> and so no complaints about that. But it's our information was somewhat subjective. I feel like companies like Gnosis Freight are going to make all of this objective. So when somebody's looking at a report of how are we doing it's not informed by a whole bunch of people who are trying to cover their <laughs> ass on these numbers. <laughs> so please elaborate. Yeah, definitely. And you 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 hit the nail on the head. And it's a, a lot of so we approach this from a few different ways. Is you can get the true say a delivery to your point. You get the true granular data point of a delivery through geofencing on an ELD. Those, that's one of the methods that you can use. You can have a security guard check-in. That, that's an electronic data point. That's a gate in, gate out at a yard. Um, you can do it not at a delivery location for a container like a warehouse or distribution center. You can do it at a terminal because you can use AIS data to say, hey, this vessel docked. The, literally the AIS status changed from the number zero to one or three to four, whatever those numbers are that say it was docked and now it's not docked or whatever it is to use those different data points to produce that source of truth. And that's what Gnosis is always getting to. There's still always the capability for, we, we have in our platform, the ability for someone at a distribution center to click a button and say the truck got here at this time. <laughs> so there's still the manual input capability to make it easy, but there's all these other digital methodologies that'll continue to get better that kind of supersede what the manual inputs are. I imagine there'll be a time and it won't be too long where you'll show me a report and it'll show all the numbers that are green. Maybe you won't use green, but maybe you say the numbers that are green are objective from systems. So that was a, a timestamp from a system. And the ones that are red are going to be manual inputs. And again, not to say we're all lying when we put manual inputs. Sometimes we just don't have the data. But I keep thinking, if you want to have good reports, you have good information going into them. And again, you're going to move us from a world of subjective to a world of objective. I hope so, Joe. That's the plan. And it'll, uh, <laughs> it, the, co the coverage continues to, to get better and better. And there's companies in the space that are doing some really cool stuff about using AI to digitize streams of you know, cameras and read container numbers and, and do all kinds of stuff. So it's an exciting time for sure. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So Jake, I want to wrap this bad boy up. I've gone way over my time with you. By the way, guys, if you want to know more about this whole topic, I'm going to put a link to the book Jake and I were talking about before we hit record. It's called The Box, How the Shipping Container Made the World Smaller and the World Economy Bigger. I had to write it down because it's so long. But Jake and I were talking before we hit record about Everything around us came in a shipping container. Everything you're looking at in your car or at Home Depot or wherever you're at came in a shipping container, virtually everything. And we take it for granted that has made global trade work and it works unbelievably well compared to just 40 years ago, which can shipping containers really came about in the 60s, late 50s, early 60s. So it's unbelievable, but we can do so much better, which is what we're talking about today. So I want to summarize, get your final thoughts, Jake. So I'm talking to my friend, Jake Hoffman, container lifecycle management, 
Gnosis Freight Streamlines International Logistics and how they streamline. Why, first off, why we need to streamline. So we have all this, we have all these problems, demurrage, detention, invoicing, invoice auditing that has to be done, delays, lots of challenges. What Gnosis Freight does is help us get high quality data and then put it in a format that we can make some decisions, good decisions. We're going from reactive to proactive. Now I can start to actually plan save that money, but then move to that place where I'm planning and I'm eliminating all sorts of costs because I'm being more proactive. And then we'll let you, I'll let you summarize more about the solutions, but we had lots, we still have lots of problems. And again, I think the things that Gnosis Freight is doing is going to solve some of those problems. Wrap this bad boy up, put a big old bow on this one, Jay Kaufman. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, and you, you said it well. The thesis of Gnosis is to take the data from all these different places in the world around the international supply chain, standardize, normalize, put predictions on top of it, cleanse and enrich the data, and then also allow our customers, the shippers, the drage carriers, the freight forwarders, whoever we're working with, to take action on that data. No, we want the days to be gone where people are searching through spreadsheets and different websites and all those things to identify where something's wrong. And we want to surface all that information, sort it, filter it, do all the stuff to let them know what's important, and then also create some of the automations of the execution on top of it. And visibility meets execution is the idea. You can talk about all this data and things, but then the execution piece is, okay, what are you going to do with that data? The thing I'll say on Gnosis that I'm trying to do a better job of taught when I talk to people and I talk about Gnosis as a whole, I have a super easy job. My job is to to brag on Gnosis and to come up with ideas about how we can do uh, this thing and solve it for our customers. And I am so confident when I talk to people about it because of our team. The engineers and the people that work at Gnosis, I I told you, Joe, every single one of our customers has engineers that are their account managers. And so when I take and talk to a potential customer or I talk about a potential solution and do these things and then throw it over the wall at our engineers that are here in Charleston in the building, I have 100% confidence that they're going to follow through and work on these things for their customers and get them to a solution and make them happy because I've seen it happen over and over. We have some super smart people that come from all walks of life and investment banking or quant trading, like what I was going to do before, that have come and embraced this international freight ecosystem and taken the mindset of problem solving and tackling this huge problem to surface solutions for the people that they work with. And we have the Fortune 10, Fortune 50, Fortune 500 customers that have been working with us for years now to prove that thesis out. And that's, like I said, I sometimes say I'm the the dumbest engineer here. I get credit for all the stuff that the super smart guys here, guys and girls here, and everything that they do every day. If you're the dumbest guy there, that must be a pretty smart place, Jake. So They're they're smart. (laughs) So I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, link to your website, and any other links you and your marketing team give me. What conferences will we see you and the Gnosis Freight people at in the future? So we do TPM every year. That's probably our biggest conference. Late February, early March in Long Beach. We had a big presence there this year. We've been all over the map. I think we have some guys attending AgTC, the exporter conference in Seattle, Tacoma next week. And then there's the Freight Waves events. We'll be attending those coming up. I think there's one in June and then the one later in the fall, F3. We'll be at F3 for sure. And then JOC Inland, the J- the Inland Rail equivalent of TPM that the JOC puts on in Chicago every year will be there later this year. Awesome, awesome. So if we if they want to find you, they can find you. And again, I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, link to your website, any other links you give me. Jake, thank you so much. And I know we went way over time. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Love what you guys are doing. Thank you, Joe. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me on. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, Onward and Upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.